And so why don't we start right now with Dr. Mark McClellan. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for coming and for doing this on, on a short notice. Uh, let me try to do justice to your biography. And as I said to you and others, uh, it would take 25 minutes to go through all of it, but I will just briefly summarize it. Uh, you're a graduate, you're a native of Texas, graduate of the University of Texas. Uh, you have a medical degree from a joint, uh, from the Harvard Medical School. You have a PhD from econo in e economics from MIT. You have a master's degree from the Kennedy School. You've served in the uh, Treasury Department, a member of the Council of Economic Advisors. You've worked on the White House staff, and you've been FDA commissioner, and you also oversaw uh, for a number of years as well the uh, Medicare and Medicaid services part of our government. And you are now uh, teaching at Duke, among other things, consulting and so forth. So thank you very much, Mark, for, for agreeing to join us. Well, great to be here in such a distinguished company with the Economic Club. Well, thank you. And uh, so let's start uh, right at the beginning. Uh, when will I be able to get my vaccine? <laughs> well, that's a complicated answer, but uh, the, the early vaccines, David, could be available as soon as this fall, probably for high priority patients. And I'm talking fall, like November, December. Uh, the clinical, the large clinical trial, the phase three trial for one of the vaccines by Moderna is getting underway in the United States right now. There are other advanced clinical trials going on elsewhere in the world and more vaccines coming after that, uh, probably three starting clinical large scale, big clinical trials this month, a couple of more later in the fall. I, the thing I would emphasize is that none of these vaccines are likely to be perfect and there are things that can still go wrong along the way. And even when they do become available, there are still going to be issues around distribution, around prioritizing people who need it most. So this is gonna be a process and, and you'll be hearing more in the weeks ahead about how the vaccines might be distributed, how they're actually doing in the further clinical testing. Um, so, so we've still got a ways to go before uh, you're getting your, your uh, shots. I take it 70 year old private equity professionals will not be considered high priority people, but. Um... <laughs> well, well over, uh, over 65, I know you're still young, but uh, over 65 is an elevated risk group, which is probably gonna be in the, uh, in the earlier segment to, to be vaccinated, especially if we're still having lots of outbreaks of uh, COVID, which seems you know, unfortunately likely at this point. So normally phase three at the FDA before you can have a drug uh, available to the public takes about 30,000 people in a phase three. Um, how can you really do 30,000 people so quickly on these, on these uh, vaccines? Will, are you really, is the FDA telescoping this such that we, we may not get vaccines that are really as safe as normal or is that not a problem? Well, FDA has tried to make a lot of things that typically happen in sequence in vaccine development go forward in parallel. So first, some very clear guidance about what was needed to get a vaccine into clinical testing in people. Now guidance on how to do these large scale trials, as you said, with uh, 30,000 people, the, the more people that enroll, the better. Um, you know, unfortunately for the United States, we're actually a good place to do clinical trials for vaccines because there's so many communities that have high rates of cases. And so those clinical trials are ongoing or starting now uh, with recruitment in the South and the West, and especially in areas with lots of uh, cases present. And also going on in parallel is manufacturing of the vaccine. That normally happens next, so that when the studies do conclude that a vaccine is safe and effective enough, and I don't think FDA has done anything to cut its standards uh, at this point, um, then it'll be available quickly. So that's why, why this years long process has required a lot of money up front because the health and economic consequences of the virus. So billions of dollars in co-investment by the government and going at risk with the manufacturing capacity and setting up these large scale clinical trials. Um, but uh, we, we've still got some work to do before we know if the vaccines work and to distribute them successfully to get people to, to agree that they, they actually want to be vaccinated at a large enough scale that we can, um, can, can uh, contain and eliminate the pandemic. Well, um, let me ask you about this. Uh, as you mentioned, a lot of money has been put in this. U.S. government has put billions and billions in these companies. I'm a capitalist, obviously, but is it fair for companies to get billions from the U.S. government and then not have these vaccines be either free or very, very cheap? Or why should the companies decide the pricing? Well, David, I think that Americans can expect the vaccines to be either free or cheap. Uh, that, that's less of the issue than how much are we really 
paying for them, how much of the manufacturer is going to get per dose, uh, for example, especially with all of this upfront help. A number of the manufacturers have said that they're aiming for pricing that's at a not-for-profit level. Uh, not clear what that means. Some of these early contracts uh, suggested, like uh, for the AstraZeneca vaccine with, with uh, Oxford University, that the pricing might be in the $3 or $4 range. Some of the more recent contracts suggest maybe $20. Uh, Moderna has not yet said uh, what, what their pricing strategy is going to be. So that's going to be a live issue too. Um, I would expect the numbers to come out much lower than you know, sort of a, a usual price outside of a public health emergency context. But we're still talking about billions of dollars in, uh, uh, in payments. Now, vaccines always, like all medications, have some side effects. What are likely to be the side effects of this vaccine? And will you be get one shot and that's all you need for your life? Or you have to get one every month or once a year? How does it work? Well, there, there are six major platforms of vaccines that are getting into this advanced development now, and it varies across the vaccines. Uh, so far, the main side effects that we've seen in the early clinical testing in people have been the usual things that you'd expect with vaccines, fever, soreness at the site, uh, aches, things like that. And some of those are occurring at, at, at high enough rates that people may, um, uh, may have some concerns about taking the vaccine. So we'll have to see how the larger scale clinical testing goes. That's why it's so important. Um, there is also large scale testing for at least months afterwards. These trials are gonna take months to get an idea about whether there are any um, at least uh, immediate uh, side effects associated with the vaccine in the, in the months after they're being taken. There's gonna be a lot of work done after the vaccines are made available to follow up on any long-term consequences. Um, so we've still got some important unanswered questions. For the, some of these vaccines we've actually used in other diseases before, like the, the J&J &J one, the Oxford one. So we've got a pretty good track record in general of how safe they are and what the side effects are. So that's reassuring. Some of them are newer, the, the mRNA vaccines like the Moderna vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine haven't been used before. And so there may be more questions there. Uh, and for most of these vaccines, it looks like it's gonna be two doses, especially the ones that come first. Uh, some of the vaccines, uh, maybe, maybe the Oxford one with uh, AstraZeneca and the J&J &J one are, are aiming for, for one dose. Um, so all of those are considerations. The other thing to emphasize is that vaccines to work effectively doesn't mean they always work perfectly. So think about the flu vax um, in a typical year, it might prevent you know, 60, 70% of cases might reduce the severity of cases, but not 100%. And that's what people should be expecting with these vaccines too. So what about testing? Uh, even as today, here we are in uh, just about August and uh, many, many months after this virus uh, struck this country and the world, and people in the United States still can't seem to get testing. How can somebody get a test quickly and get quick results? How do, how do you do that? Well, uh, you, you're not doing it. We're not doing it right now in the United States uh, reliably. We, David, desperately need a, a real national strategy around testing. So we've got guidance on, from CDC and the government on many people who should get tested. That's people who have symptoms, those who are close contacts of people who are known to be infected, and they should be tested with tests that are really accurate. Um, the so-called laboratory tests that labs like Quest and LabCorp are doing that are based on PCR technology and get accurate results like, you know, 99% of the time. Right. Uh, the part of the problem is that we're not doing fewer of those tests. We're doing more than ever, you know, five, six million a week now. Uh, the problem is that we're also doing a lot of testing, understandably, in other types of groups as well. So uh, people who are trying to go back to work, high risk settings like nursing home uh, residents and workers, you know, that's 4 million tests if you're testing everybody who worked in or was in a nursing home or kind of advanced assisted living facility in the United States. Uh, the NBA and sports leagues are trying to get back, businesses are trying to get back, um, hospitals that are reopening are testing all of their patients and the supply is just not keeping up with demand. So a testing strategy here would recognize that these different types of needs merit different kinds of tests. Uh, there are more uh, so-called screening tests that could be used at large scale, pooled testing, uh, tests using antigens, tests using other point of care technologies, 
that are not perfect. They're not as reliable as the lab tests that you really need for people where you're really worried about an infection. But if part of the goal is to just detect an outbreak early in a workplace, well, that's where fast testing, frequent testing in a lot of people uh, could really pay off and take the load off the, the, the lab testing that we're seeing now. So that's what I mean by getting a, a national strategy in place. Hopefully Congress is gonna take action on this in the next week or two. We have uh, about 150,000 Americans have died so far. Yeah, More no. than in any war we've ever fought except World War II and the Civil War. An extraordinary number of people. Are we die having that many people die because we're doing more? We're testing, are they dying because we're doing so many tests out there? Is that why they're dying? <laughs> no, that's definitely not why you hear they're me? dying. They're dying because they're we not dying because controlled. we're doing so much testing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. That, that is not why <laughs> they're dying because we haven't controlled uh, uh, the pandemic, David. Hopefully, more testing, especially in high risk settings where we're seeing a lot of these outbreaks, um, communities with uh, low income individuals who are. Uh, living close together, um, uh, worker, uh, workers who are in essential worker settings. These individuals, people in nursing homes, make up a disproportionate share of the deaths, and we've got to do a better job of, of containment in those high-risk populations through steps like more aggressive testing. What about therapeutics? Where does that stand? Uh, we're making progress. The um, the one treatment that's been shown to be effective, remdesivir and antiviral is uh, out there. The, the bad news is just like everything else with the pandemic, executing at scale is turning out to be a challenge. So uh, Gilead, the manufacturer has made available 500,000 doses. Now through September, just about all of that supply going to the US. Um, unfortunately, that's not as many cases as we have of hospitalized patients who could actually benefit from remdesivir. So there are a number of other treatments in development, including uh, convalescent plasma, plasma from people who have recovered. Hopefully that will turn out to work. There are clinical trials going on there too. We've got a lot of survivors of COVID-19 who could be donors. And there's some very promising neutralizing antibody therapies that are entering clinical testing now too. Uh, those are based on monoclonal antibody techniques. It's advanced biologic manufacturing. My worry there is same thing as we're seeing with remdesivir, is, is just being able to manufacture enough of those treatments at scale. And then finally, we're learning more about how to treat the most severely ill patients. A great study done in England by a trial called the Recovery Trial, which um, uh, enrolled many patients from many, many hospitals in England. Would love to see something like that happen here. Found that steroids could help in, in very severely ill patients, not something you necessarily expect. And there are other testing going on around drugs that can affect uh, blood clotting, drugs that can affect the immune reaction. We're learning more about how to treat hospitalized patients, and hopefully that's going to get better. That would really take the edge off of this. It's just a reminder, though, that we need to be careful about not overwhelming our hospitals if we want to prevent the deaths. Now, early on, when people got this in the first couple of months and they went into the hospital and they went onto a ventilator, I think 65% of the people never got off those ventilators. That's right, they died. Is that, is that the case yeah, now? Yeah, the death rates were extremely high and those have come down. It's partly because uh, some of the patients who are coming down with COVID-19 are now more broad spectrum of the community, younger individuals, um, um, uh, individuals in minority communities. So the age distribution has come down some, that's probably contributed to the improvement okay. in survival but we're also getting better at treating those patients. Few of them are, we've learned how to uh, keep uh, more of those patients off the ventilators through other types of breathing support. We've uh, developed better ventilator techniques. The hospitals aren't quite as stressed. We've got more capacity uh, than we did uh, earlier this year. But David, we're still running into challenges because we have so many cases in so many parts of the country, even with uh, hospitals that have staffed up and, and, and gotten the surge capacity, we're still running short on personnel. And we've really got to do more to get the, the, the rate of cases down uh, in, in, the, in this country. Now, one of my daughters came down with COVID-19. Uh, oh, sorry my son-in-law came down with COVID-19. My six-month-old grandson came down with it. And my <laughs> two-year-old granddaughter came down with it. And now my six-month-old grandson has antibodies, 
And is he the youngest person in the United States with antibodies? I don't know. But what does it mean when you have antibodies? Does that mean they're protected for life or maybe for a short period of time? And what do you think the long-term consequences of getting COVID-19 when you're a little kid might be? Uh, well, we don't know the answer to that. And, and, you know, unfortunately, it does look like for some people, uh, there are long-term complications, lung complications, some concerns about maybe neurologic too. Now, fortunately, those seem like uh, happening at a low rate, and, and this is still early on, you know, it's hard to sort out uh, causality, uh, but there does need, there do need to be very good longer term studies of the complications that are happening in all of uh, so many patients that have been affected by COVID. With respect to immunity, um, we're not seeing uh, very many cases of people being infected and then reinfected again soon. Um, it, I, I wouldn't put too much stock in the studies that show that, you know, your antibody levels go up and they go back down. That's, that's just the way antibody responses work. It doesn't mean your body's forgotten about this infection and won't be able to fight it off the next time. But whether we need um, uh, booster shots for uh, COVID every year uh, or every five years or whether one infection is enough, that's still, I, I think that's still not determined. So what's going on in your home state of Texas now? Uh, can you explain what happened in Texas? They seem to be okay. Now all of a sudden there's a gigantic wave there in Louisiana and Florida. What happened? Well, they're not okay. The, um, the state and other states have reopened under uh, approaches that didn't really follow recommendations that, that uh, other public health experts have made. I, our, our group worked on, uh, Ash Jaws uh, group worked on about getting the, the case rate down and getting enough testing and contact tracing in place to really contain outbreaks. And so we've seen a lot of reopening and under conditions that have led to bigger spreads. I think some good news in Texas is that there has been a shift, uh, David. I think our, our culture is starting to change a bit around the basic steps that are really important for everybody to take to help reduce the spread of COVID. And that's masks, it's keeping a distance, it's not gathering in large groups, meaning like under 10. So more people are doing that. And that along with the state um, and, and other state uh, states like Texas pulling back on just how much of the economy is reopened uh, has helped. But Texas is kind of stabilizing at a very high level of cases. Uh, nationally, we've had over you know, 60,000 cases a day, every recorded every day this week. And that's uh, only a small fraction of the, the true cases that are, that are probably out there. Um, so we've got, to do, we've got to do a better job. You know, we've, we've talked about testing uh, more and a, and a real national testing strategy. We've talked about other steps that could be taken to, to slow down the spread and, and get more of this culture change. You know, I think it's gonna be, it really would take like seven, eight, nine months of um, many more Americans, you know, 80, 90% of us following those basic guidelines, just like we do with not smoking indoors, you know, wearing a seatbelt, things like that. Um, that that's going to be an important part of, uh, of getting there too. And there's still, I just want to go back to, this is a, a very disparate um, uh, infection in terms of its impact. Uh, so Texas overall cases are stabilizing, but down in the Rio Grande Valley, which is a, a low income area, high Latinx population, still seeing hospitals that are closer at capacity, still seeing very high uh, rates of new cases and, and deaths. Um, and it's just a reminder that if we don't step it up around high risk, around containment in high risk populations, essential workers, um, uh, uh, other uh, settings where outbreaks can occur, inclu including schools and, and uh, universities, uh, we're gonna have a very tough fall. So uh, if I want to avoid getting uh, this disease, should I be taking hydroxychloroquine? Uh, no, <laughs> I, I wouldn't recommend that. The, the randomized studies, the good studies, have not shown any benefit and potentially some, some harm. And you know, if there's another message in this, it's that for all of these treatments that we're developing, we, we need to do as much as possible to, to test them using um, randomized studies so that you can really figure out if it's a treatment that works or not. The US government is increasing that kind of clinical trial work through the active program and Operation Warp Speed. I, along with a number of other former FDA commissioners have been calling for really trying to ramp out the way that we do studies, make it easier for people in hospitals, people in community settings to participate in a simple study using electronic data where there is randomization, where we really don't know whether a treatment works. There's so many people getting treated in this country, David, and a lot of the treatments we're using 
using, we just don't have good evidence on, we could do better. So if the next president of the United States, if it's President Trump reelected or President Biden, um, if he becomes president, if they sat you down and said, okay, I want to start afresh, January 20th, give me a strategy, what would you recommend that the new president do? Uh, David, we've already talked about a testing strategy. We've already talked about the steps that people can take. So uh, mask mandates, they do work. I think something like that nationally, a clearer strategy around when and how states should reopen, when they need to pull back and how. Uh, we know a lot more about how to do that now. And then we've taken a lot of steps to make vaccines available as quickly as possible through things like this parallel approach to development and advanced manufacturing. I haven't seen nearly as much progress in that area though on some of these other therapeutics. I'm worried about shortages of monoclonal antibodies in the fall, which could be helpful for if the vaccines right. don't work that great or if they're elderly people who don't mount a good immune response, having a large supply of that would help a lot. So additional manufacturing capacity for other therapeutics and for diagnostics. We need to have, a, again, a lot more effective uh, and coordinated testing strategy than we're implementing now. Now, you used to run Medicare and Medicaid, part of our government, which is complicated. Um, is the COVID crisis because of the healthcare costs increasing and so forth, is that straining Medicare, Medicaid? And what are we going to be able to do about the enormous uh, costs of Medicare, Medicaid? How are we going to put that under control at some point, if ever? It's a huge long-term problem, David, especially with the fiscal position that we're headed into thanks to the pandemic. But actually, the pandemic's probably been the, the best thing, um, certainly in my lifetime, for healthcare cost growth. Um, when the shutdown occurred nationally, and even now as we're opening back up, Healthcare spending for routine services, so-called elective services, has come way down. Uh, so our healthcare spending is, is, is lower, uh, so lower than it has been. That's had some good and bad consequences. You know, we've, we've seen a big switch to, to telemedicine. That's something that many people thought was going to take forever. But, you know, when, when push came to shove, we've seen a big shift in the way people are getting care much more at home. We've seen a big reduction in many procedures that, that uh, um, health policy people like me have thought we could do with uh, a lot less of, a lot of imaging tests that probably aren't needed, a lot of uh, uh, procedures that aren't needed. On the other hand, we've also lost a lot of procedures and, and services like vaccinations and, and early cancer uh, screening and so forth that, that really is needed. So I think the question going forward for our healthcare system is, can we take the silver lining out of the transformation in care that's had to happen over the last four months, the good things, uh, right. rely more on telehealth, not doing treatments that really don't have much value, redesigning care to really focus on what matters to people. We've been doing a lot of work, David, on new payment models that, um, that, don't, that aren't based on fee-for-service. Fee-for-service has been very bad for healthcare providers. Primary care providers are going out of business uh, because their revenues are down so much. An alternative is paying for the people they're taking care of, you know, paying more for health, as our health secretary in the state of North Carolina says, paying at the person level to really support these and lean into these new kinds of care models. And I think a big question for our healthcare system is, can we come out of this um, pandemic with resilience? Can we rebuild, not going back to the healthcare we had before, which is really expensive, inconvenient, uncoordinated, um, we've seen people come together, like health professionals do amazing work, not just on the front lines in hospitals, but in reaching out to their patients, helping them get care at home, dealing with hunger, dealing with social isolation. That's the kind of health care we want. It brings out the best in our health professionals. And we just need to change our payment systems beyond the public health emergency to encourage that. So given your final question, given who you are, the FDA commissioner, former head of Medicare, Medicaid, all those degrees you have, how are you making sure that you aren't getting any disease? Because it wouldn't look good if you got a disease. So what are you doing <laughs> to make sure you don't get this? No, it wouldn't. And uh, we've talked about those important uh, basic steps. They're pretty clear. We try to follow them uh, as, uh, as much as we can. My hope, too, is that if uh, people follow those guidelines, it'll not only help prevent the spread of COVID, it'll also help uh, prevent a bad flu season this year. If you look at the Southern Hemisphere, because of all the COVID steps, uh, flu cases are way down. So there, there's some things that we can do to not only help with COVID and, and keep ourselves healthy, but, but really uh, uh, protect the whole country going forward. Thank you very much, Mark. And thanks for substituting and doing a great job. Appreciate it, great Mark. Great to be with you.